This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They I felt, felt I felt right. right. I was so and I just thought, well, I figured it, out. it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's storyteller is Steve Mursky. The story was recorded in October 2012 at Union Hall in Brooklyn. The theme of the event was chemistry. So I I was also an awesome, horrible graduate student in chemistry. I went to Cornell University in the chem program, and um, I I was not a good student. I was a pretty decent lab instructor, though. I had uh, the honors freshman chemistry students. These were kids who, even as freshmen, knew they were already majoring in chemistry. They weren't pre-med. They were going to be chemists. And um, so I was the TA. I don't even remember what TA stands for. Does anybody remember? (laughs) Teaching assistant. That's it. And uh, so I, I ran the lab. And uh, just to give you an example of um, how sometimes I was able to reach some of the chem undergraduate students, we were building a distillation apparatus, and everybody had to build their own. Was, that was funny? Okay. Well, well, I guess, you know, some of you have probably built distillation apparatuses at home in the bathtub for your own purposes. But... Um, uh, so the, the key element, not chemical element, but piece of glassware in the distillation apparatus is this tube within a tube in which the sample that you're boiling off condenses down because the tube inside, the other tube, is where the sample is, and the outer tube connects up to just tap water, cold tap water from the sink, and that cold tap water condenses out whatever it is you're boiling up. So you you have the tube inside the other tube, and one of the students just doesn't see this, and he comes up to me and says, I don't understand why doesn't the tap water contaminate the sample? And, you know, it's a good question. He, He was brave enough to ask it rather than just keep going without understanding what was going on. And I thought, and I said, how how am I gonna get this through in a really simple way? And I said, Let me ask you this. How come when you take a shower, the water doesn't come out your ass? (laughs) Tube within a tube. (laughs) And the kid the kid was like, thank you. (laughs) The great moments in pedagogy, I know. But the kid, the kid got it. I could see on his face. Oh, oh, okay, sure. It's a tube within a tube. Anyway, so um, I finished up my master's degree at Cornell. It was a PhD program, but I got a master's, which is sort of like when you're on a game show and, they, and your lovely parting gift. And um, uh, in fact, my advisor was Roald Hoffman, who you just heard about, and uh, he gave me some bad advice also. He said, you, he said, you should stay for your doctorate. And we knew that that was not a good idea, we being me. So, so I left, and I became a, a science journalist, a science writer, because uh, sometimes it's not journalism, it's writing. And a few years later, this is now the late 80s, I was working as the science writer at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine up in the Bronx near where I live. And uh, I had an old friend named Paul who invited me over for dinner. Paul and I went back at that point, 10 years, we're still friends. And we had met at this horrible job. I needed a job, 
This is uh, 1978. I needed a job that left me free during the day because I had this uh, crazy idea that I was going to go on the stage. Um, so I needed days to go on auditions. So I figured, well, but I also need money, so I'll get a, a job at night. And I took a job at Montefiore Hospital up in the Bronx in the medical records department. And this was a horrible job from midnight to 8 a.m. You would show up at midnight, they'd give you a stack about five inches thick of, of pink slips. On each slip was somebody's name with an identification number. And then you would go back in like, it was like a library of these folders which had all their medical records, all the people who were going to be at the clinics the next day. And you had to pull the medical records and put them on these carts that would get taken to the clinics the next day. So, I mean, imagine this room. It's, it's incredibly dusty, and the medical records, who knows what kind of pathogens are on all these records. <laughs> you know, there are viruses, bacteria, protists of unknown varieties, who knows what. The first three or four nights I worked there, I, I had some kind of allergic reaction. My eyes would just, like, swell shut, which is a wonderful look when you're trying to go on an audition the next day. So uh, Paul was already working there for a couple of weeks, and he and I hit it off, and we, we became friends. And, and it's almost like you're army buddies because you're in this horrible situation. It's midnight. It's just the two of you, and you're going through this labyrinth of dusty medical charts all night with Larry King on the radio. You would, you would pray that Larry King had a good guest that night. He used to do this overnight radio show many years ago. Anyway, so I lasted two months, and I had to get out. Paul stayed for six years underground in this horrible situation. So after I left, I wound up going to college, then I went to grad school, and then I was working. So that takes us up to where I get an, an invite from Paul. Paul had met a woman named Vicky, who was a nurse at Montefiore, when he went to the emergency room one night, and he invited me over for dinner to meet Vicky. So I show up at their place, and we're, we're sitting and talking, and Paul says, by the way, you guys have something in common. What's that? Uh, Steve has a master's in chemistry from Cornell, and Vicky also has a chemistry degree. I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, where did you go? She says, yeah, I, I went to Columbia University, and I have a master's in chemistry too. <clears throat> and I thought, well, that's, that's a little unusual. Um, are there any nurses in the house? Is there, are there any nurses in the house? Is there a nurse in the house? No. Okay. Uh, good. Then we can talk. Not to disparage nurses, nurses are brilliant people. Many of them are much smarter, as you well know, than the doctors who they lead around. Careful now. Oh, there are doctors in the house. It, it hurts when I do this. Okay. Um, so I thought, well, this, is, this is unusual. You don't, it's just not a, a typical kind of path if, you're, if you get a master's degree in chemistry, to then go on and become a nurse. Um, here, is, here is my organic chemistry textbook, my undergraduate organic chemistry textbook, and here's the one that they use for the nurses. And the nurses don't really go through the whole book either. So, um, all right, she says she went to Columbia and got a master's in chemistry. I mean, what am I going to do? Say to her, um, really? What's, what's the uh, alkane versus alkene yield in the Diels-Alder reaction? You know, that's, you just don't do something like that. But she said she went to Columbia, and I remembered, because I had read this book, that on page 859, it said, in 1954, Gilbert Stork of Columbia University showed how enamines could be used in the alkylation and acetylation of aldehydes and ketones. So I said to her, Columbia, you must know Gil Stork. I didn't know Gilbert Stork, but it, you know, it's just making conversation. And without pausing, she said, sure, I used to babysit his kids. I said, this is, this is very strange. I mean, 1954. 
is when he did this work that he's famous for. It's it's 35 years later, and, well, you know, okay, maybe he had kids late in life. I don't know. And then she starts to get upset. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, I, you know, I said a babysat the kids, and it reminded me, I, my son, I had a six-year-old son. He, he, he died a few months ago. Oof. Okay, um, well, what do you say we, we have dinner? And so anyway, I dropped the whole, I'm not sure about you. And then the next day, um, I'm talking to Paul on the phone. And I said, listen, something, something just doesn't feel right to me about Vicky. I'm, I, 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 don't, I can't put my finger on it exactly, but this thing with the chemistry degree... I, I'm not buying it for some reason. I mean, it's, it's not impossible, but people who get that degree don't really do the kind of work that she does. And he says to me, that's the same thing she said about you after you left. <laughs> and I said, dude, I think you found a really spooky, smart, and dangerous woman. I said, she picked up on the fact that I was not sure about her, and as soon as I left, she covered it by making you wonder about me. I said, I'll be happy to show you my degree. It's framed in the house, and, and people with my degree really do do the kind of work that I do. They become science journalists, some of them. Um, so I was convinced that she was really manipulative and, and you know, maybe a little sociopathic. <laughs> so I, I kept my distance, and years went by, and they actually got married, and I wasn't invited to the wedding. <laughs> 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 and... Um, and I would still see Paul occasionally when he was in my neighborhood, but I didn't go visit. And um, sometime around the mid-'90s, I get a call from him, and he says, uh, Vicky left. I said, what happened? He said, I found out she'd been buying thousands and thousands of dollars worth of jewelry on my credit cards. And I confronted her about it, and she packed her bag and left. I said, man, that's, that's pretty crazy. And he said, and then I told my mother and my sister that she had left, and they both said, oh, thank God. That chick's been stealing from us for years. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, they didn't want to say anything to me, but they were sure that whenever we would come over, there'd be little things missing. After we left, they'd say, "What you know? Where where's my bracelet?" Or you know, they were things were gone. And he told me that he had when he told his sister, his sister had said, "I had diamond earrings, and I know she stole them." And Paul said, "Why do you think that?" And she said, "If I come to your house, I bet you I'll find them in your house." And Paul said, "Come on over." She came over. She looked through dresser drawers for like two minutes and found them. And she broke down crying. And then, a couple of days later, Paul went to the Gates of Heaven Cemetery in Westchester and tried to find the grave of the dead kid. I told you about the dead kid, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he went to the office and gave them the name of the kid. And the clerk at the office says, we don't have anybody here by that name. There was no kid, there was no chemistry degree, it was, it was all made up. And Paul and I got together a little while after that, and we were sitting in a diner across from each other, and, and he still looked kind of shell-shocked. And he said, I just don't understand. How, how could I have been fooled for all these years? And I said, Paul, you never took chemistry.
let me let me let me just tell you uh, about two years ago, I was at a conference, and I'm standing there, and and I and I look to my left, and there's this old old guy standing there, and I look at his name tag, and it's Gilbert Stork, <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him, Doctor Stork, I gotta tell you a story. <laughs> That was Steve Mursky. Steve has been an editor and columnist for Scientific American since 1995. In 2006, he started the Scientific American podcast, because of which it is okay that he spends most of his days in front of a microphone in his basement. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have our magazine, archives of the podcast, and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, and Aaron Barker. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, Josh McCall, and Raffaella Benin. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Union Hall for hosting the show and to the city of New York. It's been a crazy week, and I'm proud to live here. Thanks for listening. When you need auto parts, O'ReillyAuto.com is just a click away. Order online and pick up at your local store. Visit O'ReillyAuto.com. Oh, oh, oh.